In the previous video I said that the next thing I wanted to do was talking about optimizing the thermal design of my extruder. Version 4.1 doesn't look that much different than the extruder shown previously, but it's another step in the right direction. The copper pipe for the water cooling is now sealed by soldering, so water no longer drips out even during intensive use. The extruder tube has been significantly shortened in two places. What is most noticeable is that the aluminum block with the heating cartridge is designed to be more compact, so that the hot side of the extruder could be made shorter. This not only saves weight, but the volume of the heated plastic has also become significantly smaller. The larger this volume, the longer it takes for the plastic to be extruded, going from solid granules at the cold end into molten state at the nozzle. Plastic decomposes at high temperatures, so it should only be heated for as short a time as possible. The second place where the tube design was reduced is the distance from the hot end to the cold end. The transition from solid to liquid takes therefore place in a smaller volume, which results in less friction on the auger screw and also a smaller force component in the direction of the nozzle. This means that the mechanics bend less during extrusion, which leads to quicker response on retract. For a deeper understanding of the construction principles and for very brave early adopters, here is a rough description of how I made version 4.1. The core element is the tube and it is composed of three parts. The middle part is the heat barrier consisting of an 11mm long piece of stainless steel tube with 6mm inner and 7mm outer diameter, which corresponds to a wall thickness of 0.5mm. On the one hand, this tube is sufficiently sturdy and, on the other hand, thin-walled enough to allow as little heat as possible to pass from the hot to the cold end. The upper and lower parts were made from 10mm round brass on my lathe. This is a cheap entry-level model that can at least machine brass with sufficient precision. And yes, even with my clumsy handling of this lathe in this video, you get a well-functioning extruder. The lower part is 12 to 13 mm long and is drilled through with a 5 mm hole after it has been correctly cut to length. Then a 6mm hole with a depth of about 7mm is drilled. And finally a 7mm hole goes about 3mm deep. An M6 thread is cut from the other end for the nozzle. The upper part is 17 to 18 mm long. This is drilled completely through with a 6 mm drill. Then a hole of 7 mm with a depth of 3 mm is made for the connection to the stainless steel tube. At the other end drill about 8 mm deep with a 7 mm drill. About 6 mm deep with an 8 mm drill. And finally about 4 mm deep with a 9 mm drill. At this end the granules enter the extruder and the step bore is intended to support this process. The three parts are now put on a piece of M6 thread. The parts can then be braced with flux coated silver solder.
After cooling, the M6 thread can be removed for testing. The three parts should be joined in one line and must be airtight. For the water cooling I use 15mm diameter copper pipe which gets the necessary holes using a 3D printed template. The M5 threaded rods, the end caps and the 4mm press tubes are soldered with electronic solder. The high temperatures for brazing would weaken the copper pipe too much. Also, tin solder is significantly cheaper than silver solder. If everything is airtight, the extruder tube is also connected to the copper pipe by tin solder. Make sure that the extruder tube is oriented perpendicular to the copper pipe and threaded rods. If everything is still airtight afterwards, this core component can be screwed to the plastic parts. These 3D printed parts are identical to those of the previous version. The 4.5mm diameter wood screw that I use for extrusion is almost identical. The only change I made was cutting off the tip. There are saw teeth on this which are useful for functioning as a wood screw but cause unnecessarily high friction when used as an auger. The screw extends to around 5mm above the nozzle shaft. I achieved the best results with this depth in the extruder. When soldering the M8 nut, a wooden block helps to center the two components. It is obvious that there is still a lot of room for optimization in terms of weight and dimensions. Time for a first test print with a brand new extruder. Again, a track link which is only 25 times 27 times 12 mm small is printed. My eagle eyed followers might notice that the paths of the track link are processed in a slightly different order. The reason for this is the use of a different slicing software. The slicer I used so far was last updated more than 3 years ago. Time to try something new. I now use Prusa Slicer whose user interface is very similar to my old software so the changeover was no problem to me. Adopting all the settings such as the extrusion width, filament multiplier and other parameters was also easy. The old firmware of my equally old printer doesn't allow finesses like pressure advance and that's a good thing in this phase of experimentation. Bad hardware engineers always say the software guys have to fix this. But I want to see where the mechanical weak points are and it would be a hindrance if the slicing software led me to believe I had a better extruder than is actually the case. After the hardware is optimized, the software can put the cherry on the cake. The relatively soft plastic parts of my extruder are also helpful at the moment. You can see from the retract behavior whether the new extruder really works with lower forces and that is obviously true for this iteration. The unwanted knobs at retract have become significantly smaller. The step from version 4 to version 4.1 was, as is usually the case, not a straightforward one. Several hours were spent making and testing less successful designs. 
More brass in the tube design means less sliding friction on the walls, as the coefficient of friction of brass is significantly smaller than that of steel. I have already ordered screws made of other materials, so that I can experiment further in this direction. The print quality of the track link is better than before, but the weak points of the old printer mechanics remain the same. Printing is finished after around 16 minutes. The use of a literally colorful mix of recycled granules causes the surface to appear more uneven than it actually is. From certain angles you can see in the grazing light that the walls were printed quite evenly and without gaps. You can see the elephant foot at the bottom and the set wobble of the printer, but the extrusion itself is, in my personal opinion, quite remarkable considering the extruder design is still quite simple. A better printer mechanics is needed, consequently one of the next steps is to convert a modern printer into a granule printer. As always, further details about version 4.1 and more about the granule extruder project can be found on my pages, have a click. Once again, a special thank you goes to my anonymous major sponsor and to all other supporters who have already used the donate button on my pages and are thus helping to improve my granule extruder. Thanks for watching and I'll be back.